Uh, who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is George Austin, and I used to work for the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, but I retired about eight years ago. So I'm a long time retired, basically. Um, my background has been principally in soft rocks. And what are they? Soft rocks are, are uh, not fire formed. In other words, not igneous rocks, not volcanoes and so forth. But um, uh, principally uh, soft rocks by sandstone, gravel, whatever. And I have worked in clays a fair amount. Done. What is a clay? What does that mean? Well, a clay means a couple of things. Uh, first, some people think it is fine rock. And uh, that is in part true. In some cases, it has minerals that are particularly found in those rocks called clay minerals. But generally speaking, when you're talking about clays, you're talking about a size range, which is less than two microns. How much is that? Well, about face powder size. So it's, it's kind of very small. And these minerals are, are mica-like. By mica, I mean they're flat line. So it's, um, you have to use an x-ray machine to identify them. They're too fine to be seen with most microscopes. Um, by x-ray machine, do you mean like a big plate that you would go to see? In the well, you can do it that way, but it's, it's a diffractometer, which impinges x-ray beams onto these plate-like gra grains, and reflection gives you how thick they are. And that tells you what clay mineral it is. Why well, is important? to know what clay m mineral it may be or not be? Well, because you're looking at something that is very small that you can't identify in much other ways, but, but they have different properties. For instance, there's some clays that expand when you put water on them. Uh, for instance? Well, the bentonites that are used in oil wells, really. Uh, some people like to know about kitty litter, which is, in many cases, a clay material. And um, then there are others that don't expand at all. And they also pick up various cations and anions, in other words, uh, stray molecules that are around. Why is that important? Well, for instance, if you're worried about kitty litter, for instance, you want to pick up things that take care of the odor, like ammonia, for instance. And it'll, the clay minerals, particularly what are called smectites or uh, montmorillonites, will pick up these odors, and they will also pick up the moisture. You mentioned oil clays, uh, mm -hmm. clays used in oil wells. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Well, if you put down a hole into the ground, uh, you have water coming into the hole, perhaps, if you run through water-bearing strata. And so you, what you want to do is get through those things without... Uh, without having the water break down the hole. So you use this clay material which packs in the pores and makes it waterproof. So it works pretty well. Where does one learn about these things other than a college, obviously, but uh, geology programs? Um, they get into it, uh, pr principally the uh, economic geology area, which is not really very popular now, but um, hydrology, you get into it. Uh, into, into clay materials. What's economic geology? Generally speaking, it's, it's uh, materials that can be used for, for profitably. In other words, you can make a profit by mining them. You could think of uh, gold, for instance, as being an economic mineral because uh, geologists help find the gold and then uh, it extracted and it sold and makes some money. You're f from where? Uh, Originally. Originally? Well, I was born in Virginia, but I did most of my growing up in Minnesota. Why? Well, my father moved there when I was quite young, and uh, he worked at a college in that area, and, and I uh, sort of hung out and graduated from that college, which was Carleton College, many years ago. Carleton uh, College is an undergraduate? Only. Uh, college only? Mm -hmm. Where'd you go to graduate school? Well, I went two places. Uh, once I finished with Carleton, which is in southeastern Minnesota, I went to Minneapolis-St. Paul, where uh, I took a master's degree at the University of Minnesota. And after working for the Minnesota Geological Survey for a while and teaching at the College of St. Thomas, which is now St. Thomas University, 
I went to Iowa, and there I got a PhD. And then? I left there and went to work for the Indiana Geological Survey. Uh, this was in the early 70s. Stayed there three years, and then found this great job in New Mexico, so I came back, came out here. Do all states have a geology agency? Yes, uh, all states and also the, uh, uh, I think Puerto Rico has one too, so. Why are they important? Well, it's, it's for the benefit of the people of the state, or in this, that case, the uh, Commonwealth. Um, people want to know about various things about geology, and so they are, have a local agency, a state agency that answers questions. Some of these agencies are also regulatory. Our, our one here in New Mexico is not. Regulatory how? What does that mean? Well, for instance, if you want to build something, uh, you might have to get a permit to, to build a, in, a, in a particular area. Sometimes you have to get a permit from, uh, to uh, extract water or whatever. But like I say, there's about, only about half the state surveys that are like this. And ours here is small or large or medium it, size? It's, it's probably compared uh, to others? a little bit bigger than most, but it's not gigantic by any means. So there are career opportunities for students who want to become ge geologists to be employed by state agencies or oh, sure. quasi- State agencies, state agencies. Uh, not only the, like the geological surveys, but also the environmental departments. Uh, various states uh, employ geologists, highway departments employ geologists. So you don't only need to teach, no. you can actually do, do. things. No, absolutely. Your career here has spanned, what, well, I 30, came in, I came in, years? I came in 1974 and I retired in the year 2000. So it was, it was about 25, a little more years. And you held lots and lots of roles. You uh, occupied roles as a geologist and then as a bureaucrat. <laughs> what a nasty word. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, the, um, uh, I first came as an industrial minerals geologist. Now that's a part of economic geology that deals with non-metallic materials. Uh, that's not a metal. metal. Or a gem. Okay. And so I worked at that for a couple of years, and then I decided to uh, try out for a little administration, so I took on the position of deputy director, and I held that for about 11 years, and then decided to go back to uh, more or less the research, which I enjoyed. So then I uh, stayed on as a senior industrial minerals geologist until 2000. And your research um, interests included what, or still include what? Well. Of course, um, industrial minerals covers lots of things. I, I got initially involved with potash, which is, of course, New Mexico uh, produces more potash than any other state. What is potash? Potash is potassium and, in most cases, chloride, but it's also potassium sulfate. It's used in fertilizers. If you look at the numbers on the bag, there's one of those numbers, I think it's the last one, is, is uh, potash or f potassium. So it's got obvious egg economic and agricultural use? Absolutely. What else? Well, uh, sand and gravel, I've been involved with that. Uh, I did get involved about 1980 with a fellow who was interested in Adobe, and uh, we uh, published a couple of books on that uh, with the, uh, the Bureau. Adobe is what? Adobe is essentially mud. It's, it's unburned brick, you might say. Now, there, by the way, there is a low burned type of material called a comato, and that's used a lot of times in, in Mexico. And what that is, it's a structural brick. It's the same thing as a regular brick, but it's fired to a low temperature. By low temperature, I mean about 800 degrees uh, or so Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot, though. So. It's, it's hot, but it doesn't melt the, the clay minerals. It sort of makes them into cinders. Does that compare to standard understanding of bricks? Well, bricks, uh, what happens with those things is that you heat them up enough so that there is a meld of these things. They partly turned into glass. So, that, and then the adobe is just mud? Mud bricks. Um, what we did was we did analyses of these bricks to see what clay minerals they contained, what um, 
particle size they had, what uh, other things they had in them besides clay minerals. And we found out some interesting things. Why is that important? Well, for one thing, uh, adobes, when you're making them, and then you've done quite a bit here in New Mexico, uh, if you have too much clay in them and you have wind, it'll crack the bricks. Mm. So by picking out the right kind of clay materials and the particle size, you can alleviate that problem of cracking. But people, when they learned to make mud bricks, didn't have access to all the a technology to understand the particle size in the earth. That's true. In fact, uh, the homemade, you might say, adobe bricks are quite different than commercial ones because the commercial ones tend to have a lot more sand in them and less clay material. Why is that important? Well, it just is, uh, most people in the old days used to make their adobe bricks uh, in their backyard. They picked up anything they can do. And of course, um, adobes being bricks, uh, being mud materials, uh, would decay if you didn't take care of them, like put a stucco on them or something like that. So it's important to, to treat them carefully. So there's a um, commercial aspect to this today. Adobe is still a popular medium. For oh, yeah. They still make about two or three million in this state alone. New Mexico alone. Yeah. And... Is it an industry that's regulated or? Oh yeah, there are state rules about this. And for instance, you can't build an adobe building in New Mexico higher than two stories. Why? I think it's principally because of the earthquake possibilities. Now, it's interesting that on Indian lands, they don't uh, adhere to this uh, state rule and they build buildings as high as three stories. However, in Europe, in the old days when they made adobe, uh, especially in southern Europe, uh, they made uh, adobe structures that were six or seven stories high. Really? Yeah. Um, how would adobes compare to brick in terms of strength, insulation, weather? Well, they have an R value of about two, but you have to remember there's a, a, a unique thing about adobes that people don't understand about the R value, and that is that you have very thick walls. And when you have thick walls, there's what is called a flywheel effect. In other words, if you heat it up, it takes a long time for the whole thing in the summer, it takes a long time for the whole brick to, or the whole wall to be heated. Similarly, in the, in the wintertime, it takes a long time for the heat to go out of it. So uh, it is actually a fairly, uh, interesting and Cooler nice. Cooler in the uh, summer, right. warmer in the winter. And anybody who has a adobe house knows that. Are people allowed to build their own homes if they choose to build them out of bricks that they make themselves? Uh, I understand that. Uh, however, I should warn you that uh, most people who make their adobes these days, their own adobes, for their own houses have lots of children who do all the work and the parents sit around and tell them what to do and where to go because the back is, it gets a little uh, out of shape if you're lifting a 30-pound adobe all the time. Where's the uh, center of manufacture now in New Mexico? Well, I think probably between Albuquerque and a place called Velarde, which is just, south, which is just north of Española. There's a fellow up there who makes uh, a, do a million adobe a year. A million a year? At Velarde, yeah. What do they cost? Retail, approximately, per um, brick. Per brick. I haven't, I haven't done this in a couple of years, yeah. but I would imagine in the neighborhood of 50 cents a brick. So he's doing well. Yeah. Now, he, sh he ships all over, by the way. Is it important to pick the proper kind of clay for these bricks? Uh, or is that kind of open-ended? Not so much in the commercial end. Because now they do another thing with adobes that, that makes them uh, useful. And that is they put what's called uh, asphalt emulsion in them. This makes them semi-impermeable. Uh, now I say semi because they don't put enough in to make it permanently so. And there are rules about, about this, how much you put in. It has to do with how long a, an adobe brick would stay as a brick if you put it into water. And if it stays for seven days and doesn't take on any water, that's, that's uh, stabilized, they say. Why is that important? 
Well, uh, some people prefer in an that. arid climate. Ooh. Well, it, when it rains, and it does rain in New Mexico, I don't, you don't think so, but it does. And uh, it, it will wear away some of these bricks. If you go out and, and look at the old houses that were constructed a century or two ago, you'll notice that if they are made of adobe, the walls go not like this, but they go like this. Yeah. And the reason is the water comes off the roof, if there is a roof, and drops on the ground and spatters on those lower adobe and wears them away. So is uh, our opera house here? No. <laughs> our opera house, was, the, opera house has, was designed that way. It was designed that way. I'm told. Okay. I wasn't around when they did. <laughs> I wasn't either. I begin to wonder. Um, Adobe would seem to be international in scope because it if is. there's mud brick in one country, is mud brick in another. Yes, it, it's, it's very much so. In fact, there's an international group that that sponsors a conference every two to three years. We had one in 1990 down in Las Cruces, and there were people from all over the world. Is Adobe the oldest construction material? No? Probably pretty close. Per I imagine stone. Permanent housing, I mean. Yeah. Stone might be uh, stone and adobe, but um, adobe is, is, is. Stone's heavier, obviously, and you need to have access to a quarry and people with tools to. Yeah cut stone, whereas Adobe, you would need a form. Well, now, to keep in mind that, that there was, uh, they did make mud materials before, uh, mud structures before Adobe. Adobe is actually came out of Africa with the Moors and went to Spain, and then it came over to our country. But uh, the Indians, before the Spanish were here, made Adobe structures, and we call them Adobe, but it's called puddled Adobe. In other words, they just take mud and put, them, and put it together. Uh, of mud. On a form or, or? No forms. Or just piles of mud? Piles of mud. If you go down to Casas, Casas Grandes in south of, uh, of um, Arizona, there's an um, a area there where it was a very large population and they had this kind of construction before Columbus ever hit the U.S. or hit the Western Hemisphere. How does that compare to rammed earth? Well, rammed materials. earth is, is a more or less uh, recent thing. We have a couple of folks in the state who do it. Uh, what you do is you put a form down, and then you pour or put in adobe materials, clay materials. Uh, sometimes there are cross pieces to help it stay. And then you just pack it down. The important thing is to pack it. And you reduce the volume by about, oh, close to uh, a quarter. In other words, so it's so the loose material is packed in there, and then it dries. And uh, you can get walls 30 inches thick quite easily. And people are creating homes from this? Oh, yes. As well? Oh, yes. Has it compared to adobe well, in terms of permanence? and form? They are very similar, uh, but uh, because they are packed materials as opposed to almost uh, not so, well, they're, they're, you, you you push the adobe in the, into the forms quite a bit, but it's not as bad as, as the uh, rammed earth, which is pushed in much harder. So I would think that it would be more uh, permanent. And keep in mind also, if you use the asphalt emulsion to make it waterproof, or at least semi-waterproof, it would be uh, a good idea too. Again, getting back to clays, is the kind of clay that's incorporated into the rammed earth why is it called rammed earth? What is earth as compared uh, to clay particles or sand particles, or is there no way to tell them apart? Well, it's, it's rammed earth because you're pushing this stuff into the form. But what is it that you're using to do uh, that? You're using a mixture of mud and sand, principally, although I've, I've seen some large rocks in some of these. Is there a ratio that people use, um, one part? Something to the two parts, something else? Not really. Uh, there are some general guidelines. Uh, commercial adobe only has uh, in the neighborhood of 10% clay material. The rest of it is silt and, clan and, silt and, and sand. What about plant material? In the Bible, there's, you know, they say they made mud bricks using straw when they didn't give them straw. They didn't do yeah, the idea is problem. to hold the particles together. And again, uh, the straw does that. Uh, there are some people who get very picky about the kind of straw. I've been told that 
oat straw is the best straw to use because it doesn't have any holes in it. And the reason you don't, uh, that's important, is that you have, might have vermin that would have access to the house through those uh, straw particles. Uh, uh, and feed on the straw. Or and pardon me? Oh, yeah. Feed on the straw or they could. the straw would decay, creating openings or something like that? Yeah. Uh, some people even use uh, manure in there to, again, make things stick together. Is there a distinction for using these earth materials as opposed to uh, concrete forms and structures in terms of the environment? Well, some people do use Portland cement in, in adobe materials. It makes it harder and, and more permanent. Um, but a key, you've got to remember that these are solid blocks and they're heavy. Yeah, I've been told that 10% of the carbon dioxide um, emitted by human activities comes from making uh, concrete cement. Well, uh, that, that's true because it, it does when you, when you drive off the, uh, it's calcium carbonate, you drive off the CO2. And when you're making cement, you make lime. And that, of course, means that CO2 is into the atmosphere. So potentially the Greeks who didn't use concrete were more environmentally attuned than well, the Romans who <laughs> created concrete. Or well, they had, they had the pozzolans, which are, are something different. A pozzolan is, is a material that when you add more lime and, and water to, it makes it cement. And they How do you spell it? Pozzolan? Yeah. Yeah, it's P-O-Z-Z, -Z, and you're on your own after that. Okay, no. <laughs> and it means what now? What it is, it's, it's a cementitious material that is not uh, itself cementitious, but when you add a little lime to it, it becomes so. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, some of the modern-day uh, things of, to get around the carbon dioxide thing is they use a little fly ash, which is also a pozzolan, in uh, making uh, certain kinds of cement you don't use it, produce so much carbon dioxide then. So it'd be fly ash from a, a, a coal-fired power plants, That's right. has an economic use to it. That's right. And what else do you do with it? it uh, you, there's nothing else you can do with it, so it, it, it takes care of waste material. From coal mines. From coal mines. That's interesting. Getting back to clays, how many kinds of clay are there? Approx well, approximately. Or the broad categories. The groups. Yeah. Yeah. There are about uh, five groups. Uh, there's uh, what is called the kaolins, which are ones that are high in alumina. Then you have the, uh, um, the illites, which are high in potassium. Then you have the smectites, which are, uh, can be all over the map. And the, those are the ones that are very expandable. You have mixed layer clays, which are uh, both expandable and non-expandable. And then you have what are called the um, adipolgites and the sepulites, which are chain clays. And these, instead of being flat, flake-like things, are long, string-like things. And their origins? Are there different origins oh, for sure. different clays? Has to do with the original parent material yeah. it's, that they come from? The, the original material probably was, was uh, um, feldspars, in other words, the potassium, aluminum, silicate. And when you add water to that and, and wear it down, you rearrange things and you produce the clays. And the feldspars are common what kinds of rocks? Well, granites and, and uh, most what are called igneous rocks. So the rock uh, cycle is an important part of creating clays. So that well, also the water, too. It's interesting. You wouldn't have any, any clays on the moon, for instance, because you don't have any water. Water, right. What about Mars? Well, I, I'm told there's, there's water there. I haven't been there to find out. So the clays are an environmental indicator as well. Yes. So you can, in part, interpret the past through looking at clay end products. Are they end products? Well, of course, they, they can break down, too. Into other things. They're, they're, they're semi-stable, you might say, but they, they go to non-crystalline material when you, when you keep wearing them down. If you keep banging away at them, they'll, they'll go away. The general the concept of clay is, is a plastic material that you can mold and shape. Are they all the same? No. 
How are they different? Um, the ones you're talking about are generally speaking of, of, of kaolins. In other words, the ones that, that are, uh, the other ones do do that, you can form them in the balls. But there are clay materials that are very hard, who don't break down in water. Uh, it has to do with the structure and how different m molecules are, are chained to each other mm -hmm. or added to each other. So there's economic aspect to the kinds of clays for certain industries. Oh, certainly. For instance, kaolin is a very, uh, as I said, it was a potassium, it's an aluminum silicate. And it is used uh, principally in, in dishes. Uh, you can use uh, ceramic materials that are made out of kaolins and so on. It's, it's a very pure clay. It tends to be white. So the, finding the locations for these would be of some importance. Certainly. Economically in this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And regulating or ownership uh, issues um, can be important, I assume, as well. In oh, certainly. Places, f for instance, like um, um, our state where lots of land is public land mm -hmm. as opposed to private land. Mm -hmm. There are obviously quarries where clay is common and uh, economic use that needs to be per uh, permitted or Yeah, uh, you have to, whoever the owner is, but now some people are able to do this. Uh, for instance, the Indians have uh, operations where they get, off, get clay materials and uh, make their pottery for, for, and it's on their land, so they, there's no big deal about that. And part of your job and career involve finding areas that uh, hadn't been found before for or, or extending, clay deposits? Or extending areas that, that, they, that they knew about. And of course we have lots of literature that went on. It's, this state survey is, uh, was operational in 1927, I think, so that um, close to, uh, well, 80 years or so, we've been uh, looking around at the various rocks, finding different things. And Mapping to... them, <laughs> putting them on maps, but in a different sense. What's a geologic map as opposed to a geographic map? Well, uh, a, a geologic map shows you the units. The units by that, I mean, for instance, if you have sandstone or limestone units or so forth. It shows that. It also shows the age of the rocks. Uh, certain ones, uh, uh, very old rocks, uh, tend to be the very hard rocks, the igneous metamorphic ones. And then the uh, younger ones tend to be the sedimentary rocks. That doesn't mean they're, they're exclusively so. For instance, we have a lot of volcanoes around, and those are igneous materials. And uh, our state is compared Two other states. Did you do the same kinds of work in Iowa or Minnesota? I work with sedimentary rocks. In, in Minnesota, I was a stratigrapher, which means what's uh, that? Stratigrapher is a person who studies the strata, sedimentary rocks, and so forth, and uh, did mapping up there. When I was in Iowa, I was in graduate school, and of course, didn't do too much mapping then. When I was in Indiana, I was interested in, I was hired as a clay mineralogist, and so I worried about the clay bearing units of the state. Again, that has economic importance, environmental importance? Certainly. What are some of the environmental uh, aspects of understanding where clays are and sands are, or, uh, gravels are? Well, um, for instance, if you're worried about landfills, and we have landfills all over the place. Uh, one of the uses of clays is to form uh, impermeable boundaries between whatever you're putting in the landfill and the groundwater table. So that? So that those, those bad materials that might leach out. All those old you know, hot dogs and well, uh, Coca-Cola cans. Or, or worse than that. And diapers. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't get into the water. and. Um, so most uh, landfills these days have a clay a permeable, a clay layer at the bottom of them. And picking that clay or the kind of clay is obviously important. You would want a clay that would stay impermeable over time? Yeah. Why would you do that as opposed to a man-made uh, well, plastic or rubber thing? Or? Well, well, keep in mind if you're talking thousands of years, and you certainly are, these plastic materials don't last that long, mm. whereas clays, 
being more um, or can be more permanent than you know, any sort of uh, plastic. Getting back to uh, why people would want an entity such as an agency, state agency, to do uh, all these tasks that are economically important or environmentally important, why is that important? Well, why could you hire a private company to do it for you? Well, you just made, said the magic word, hire. That costs money. If you can get the basic material from your state survey, why pay for it? And that's what we were supplying. We, uh, we give basic material. Now, if you want to go into details, you want to open a pit or something like that, then you get a consultant to, to help you out. But we can at least put you in the ballpark in many cases. And probably also, since you're hired by uh, people, the public, right. you work for the state right. without an outside interest and are more apt to one uh, tell the truth. Well, I should hope so. And, no, uh, over time, I mean, be, because there is no motive or in, uh, you know, incentive to make a property more important than it actually is. No. Or to make any potential problems go away, I would assume. Yeah, and... Objectivity is important. And since we're not hired, uh, that means we don't have to please uh, and give right. answers that would be especially pleasing. We can give right answers. And a continuity is important, too, because you well, can certainly. build on work that becomes public property for a long period of time. That's right. So there are you know, archives of work that people did before. Oh, many, many. People. Maps are uh, proved upon over time. Certainly. Um, new ideas come in. New techniques. And they're used. Um, who was the head of the agency when you were here? It was Frank Kotlowski, who was a long time, uh, um, well, he, he was uh, initially the director when I uh, had been, uh, when, he, when I came, he had been uh, brought in as a, the director uh, just a few years before. However, he had been here since the 1950s. And he was an interesting man from Indiana also, I think. That's right. It? He was. And what a state, his title was? Well, he, he was the, the director of the Bureau of Mines and Mineral Resources at that time. However, uh, through the course of several legislators and so forth, he became the state geologist. And the title changed because of the um, agency, I mean. Uh, yes, and, and political whims and so forth. Is there less importance now on economic aspects of geology in the United States than previously? I think in terms of training, it is. But in terms of need, I think it's very important. What does that mean? Well, Expand uh, on that a little, uh, a little bit. I, I did a search of, of the various schools that teach economic geology. And there aren't a whole heck of a lot of them, even less teaching industrial minerals, which is my particular brand. However, um, all the um, companies need geologists. They train them in, in, for what they need them for. Uh, the state agencies trained uh, their people as long as they have basic geologic training. But so, so the, the science is still going on. It's just that the, the name is not uh, particularly economic geology anymore. How do we compare it to other countries? Now, are you talking the U.S. or are you mm -hmm. talking New Mexico? Um, both, I think, in terms of our perspectives on what is usually called economic geology in the United States as compared to Europe or Africa or Asia. Well, I think that uh, people here know about it, but they don't get all involved with it. Uh, geology always used to be a, sort of a uh, something that you would go to uh, for basic information when the country wasn't that developed. Now, on the other hand, there are countries that have uh, what are called uh, professional geologists who have to sign off on things. I know, for instance, uh, Nicaragua, Nicaragua is this way. Uh, geologists have to be involved. There are some um, uh, states that where a professional geologist has, has to sign on every project that is, that is going on.
Why? Uh, because they, it is assumed that geologists will know when it's a bad project. For instance, uh, there are some areas, like in California, where you have earthquake problems. A geologist should be involved in, in projects over there that involves highways, um, for instance, uh, or building subdivisions or whatever. So uh, by, by having a geological person involved, he or she will be able to pick these uh, uh, over these plants and make sure that the, that the proper safeguards are, are used. For end price, but um, in a more logical sense, I think also we need things to build things with. That's correct. We need sand and gravel for you know, highways and roads and streets. We need clays, obviously, for various purposes. We need metals mm -hmm. for things. Most of us don't think twice about what it takes for us to live our lives. Mm -hmm. Every day, every hour, we uh, depend on everything from iron and steel that we don't understand or appreciate. Well, if you took all the people in this country and you said, um, how much do they use per year? Only about 6% of that would be metal. Most of it would be sand and gravel, one way or the other. Now, this involves roads and highways and buildings and so forth. But in terms of, of industrial minerals, like I'm talking about, they, that is the bulk of the materials used by a, a society like ours. Everything from potash for the fertilizer for our food to the sand and gravel on the streets and roads we d drive on mm -hmm. has to come from comes from someplace. Someplace. And how do we compare in understanding the, do people overseas uh, understand better than we do these aspects of things? Or I, I, I think am I being uh, too harsh? Well, I think th th that they understand uh, how much they, they are, uh, want their geologists to, to worry about things that, uh, that I can't comment on. I mean, there, there are geologists all over the world. Uh, many organizations of geologists and and they all are involved in, in various geological aspects some economic some research some service and uh, teaching also obviously of course what does the future hold do you think for uh, economic uh, geology I can't see it stopping we're always going to need m materials but there are more and more rules about certainly how things are acquired and what's done with them. All right, and also how there are, uh, what happens when they are done u being used, they're waste. After the fact. After the fact, what do you do with it? But if, they're, if the rulemaking process makes everything difficult to accomplish and, or expensive, or both, at either end, at the finding and the disposing, what does the future hold? You look for alternatives. Because we're always going to need things. I can't see a society like ours that doesn't need anything. Is there uh, competing forces for economic materials? Materials? Oh, sure. On a worldwide oh, yeah. basis? Oh, of course. There are, there's competing, uh, well, for instance, some countries need more of one thing than another. Uh, right now, a great amount of our raw materials are coming from China. It used to come raw materials. Raw from materials from China. Such as? Well, barite, for instance. What's that? Barite is a heavy mineral. It's also used in oil drilling. And uh, for, for a long time, that was used, uh, came from this country, Georgia, then Nevada. But then they discovered deposits that were useful in, in China. And that virtually killed off that uh, domestic industry. Because of quality or cost or cost, always cost. So it's cheaper to mine it in China and bring transport it, it. This yeah. heavy stuff, yeah. bring it over here and process it here, or is That's it right. processed in China? Also? All you have to do is grind it up, and you can use it. And we could do it here. What other items uh, com are these? Uh, commodities or uh, materials? Uh, materials. You, you could talk about them as commodities. Yes. What's the distinction? I don't um, understand that. I I don't really want to go into that because commodities are traded useful. or no, certainly paid for and bid on. I suppose. Oh yeah. Materials are of use. Mm -hmm. What else 
are we importing that we... Well, for instance, in New Mexico, uh, about 100 years ago, we had a big mica industry. No. Mica Mi being? Mica is a, uh, it's called a phyllosilicate. It's, it's a material that is, was used in, for instance, um, in, uh, in old stoves. If you wanted to have a window in the stove, it was made of mica because you could see through it. And it was heat tolerant. Obviously. Heat tolerant. And northern New Mexico had a great deal of this. They have what are called pegmatites up there. That means materials, rock materials with large crystals. And they had large crystals of mica. However, it was expensive to produce. And so most of the mica this day, in fact, there's none produced of what's called the, the sheet mica, the big thick sheets in this country at present, comes from India. Even though we have it here, but they, they can mine it over there and get it to us cheaper than we could make it here. What else? Well, uh, let's see. Um, well, one industry that's coming back a little bit is platinum. Platinum, uh, there used to be a mine up in Montana which uh, yeah. produced platinum for a while. And then they discovered that they could get it cheaper from other places, particularly South Africa and Russia. But that mine, because it's an essential material, uh, platinum is, they have pushed to reopen that thing, and I think it is now. Platinum's used for? Well, for instance, for your catalytic converter in your car. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Certainly for platinum is used in, in various jewelry. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's more, I think it's more valuable than gold. It's, it's over $1,000 an ounce. Way over $1,000 an ounce. Again, isn't that creating a problem for the future. If these are strategic materials that we depend upon other uh, places that aren't uh, always friendly to us. That's true. And that's uh, why you have to be very careful about being able to find alternate sources, if you can. But then it also depends on having people who could go back and refine these, find again these trained people. And experts, and you mentioned that economic geology programs are getting fewer and far between here. Yeah. Well, so uh, another industry we could talk about in that light is the uranium industry. Mm -hmm. uh, New Mexico, when I first came here, had a big uranium industry up in the Grants area, particularly. And then, because of various uh, political problems, and by that I mean environmental problems, uh, uranium was uh, just went away, and now we're because we we need energy. People are reconsidering it. We don't have a lot of people who are trained in finding it, and so those kind of geologists uh, and and engineers and so forth are are in short supply right now. So we could end up importing. Well, we do it now. Geologists also, though. Oh, certainly, there are always geologists wandering around looking for jobs. <laughs> that's that's very true. <laughs> What do you think the future of education in economic in geology is then? I hope it'll improve. I haven't seen. Is there yet. any determining factors and encouragement from industry? Industry. Or? Sure. As long as there's a need, over the years you will find people to do it. You have to pay a lot right now. Uh, I'm told that the engineering department, mineral engineering department here, uh, has. A myriad of jobs that are offered they just don't have the students who can go into them because they need engineers right now but they kids haven't gone into it therefore they're not trained so there's a shortage of engineers I'm sure the, it'll occur in geology I remember uh, hearing about in the 1950s when oil started getting really big uh, companies were taking geologists out of school before they finished their bachelor's degree. Basketball players. Well, that sort Straight of thing. Straight from high school. That's right. And you have a, t a year or two of geology and then you work for an oil company. Well, you have the need and you're going to have the money to do it, and then you'll get those people. But um, that's what's interesting, uh, too, in terms of the state agencies. How many of the state geology agencies are actively doing any of this basic? find mapping quality work I, th I think work. most of them are now uh, if you go to the uh, what's called the American Association of uh, State Geologists website 
uh, and read through their recent uh, directives, it, it looks like through the, those state agencies and the U.S. Geological Survey, they're doing a lot of mapping. Still. Yeah. And it, in some cases, it's remapping, of course. But uh, it's making good geologic maps. Can you do any um, of this from space with the news? Satellite imagery. Oh, I think so. Uh, I know, for instance, um, they were looking for clay deposits in Georgia and South Carolina, and they were able to use satellite and looking at the various wavelengths of the satellites to see where these high white clays were. And by uh, th and they did it, all this mapping and uh, found quite a number of deposits that way that weren't otherwise available. But the red, cl why are the clays in Georgia red? Because they have iron in them. But they're all not red. They're, there's a whole bunch. Right. The Georgia Kalins that, that are white. White. All right. Those are the iron in the clay is from where? Uh, when you weather iron-bearing materials, you turn it from a ferrous, uh, greenish material into red materials. The red hills we have in New Mexico have ferric iron in them. Iron that uh, has a valence of three, in other words. It's, uh, As opposed to? A valence of two. two. Yeah. If it was two, the color would be what? It would tend to be greener, and, and, but it's, uh, it does, it's, that's not the only reason. Are these after the rocks were form weathering or during the process of forming? Uh, Sometimes the that, that's a problem uh, to figure out. But in, in most cases, when you get to uh, the ferric iron, it's very stable. In other words, the, the, the red material, it's stable. Um, or yellow, uh, it tends to be stable. On the other hand, if you have organic materials there that supply the acid, you can reduce those things sometimes. So many times you'll see a red uh, area, a red rock outcrop, and there'll be sort of holes in the rock of white or green or something else. And that was because there was organic material in there that kept it from getting red. If you could uh, take us and the uh, uh, viewers through the various class sizes of materials that compose rocks from, I guess, cobbles to smaller. Well, let's take go for boulders, for instance. Okay. Boulders are any size, practically. But then as you get smaller, you go through what you call cobbles. Uh, then you get down to pebbles. And I think nobody has a problem with understanding what the difference there would be. But if you go finer than pebbles, you're getting into sand. Well, how big is sand? Sand is uh, about two millimeters to a sixteenth millimeter. In other words, uh, fairly small. Uh, you can feel it in your, if you were to put it in your mouth, you can feel the grittiness of it. Grit. Uh, smaller than that is what's called silt. And that goes from about sixteenth millimeter down to about sixty-four, uh, uh, one sixty-fourth. And that is, that is pretty fine material, but again, you still feel the grit in your teeth. However, you get into clay, which is two microns or less, and then you are talking... Micron is what? Micron is a millionth of a uh, millimeter, a millionth of a meter. Anyway, that's as fine as face powder, and you feel no grit. You can have quartz in there, which would normally be very hard, but you don't feel it because it's so fine. So each of these can then become a stone. For instance, a clay-sized particle can be a clay stone, a right. silt size, a silt stone, and on and on. Well, silt stone or shale. Sandstone. Shale is another one. Right. You see silt and clay. And then there's sandstone, as you said, larger. And larger than that, you get into things like conglomerate, which is a mixture of very coarse material. And these are independent of what the material is, actually. Yeah, it's talking about size. There's a material, could be anything. As you said, there are different kinds of clays and different kinds of you know, sands, I assume, also. Right. And they tell you something about the environment in which the rocks formed. Of course. So the present is the key to the past. I, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. All right. All right. What are your plans for the future? Oh, I just plan to stay retired. Now that you're genteel and... Uh, Oh, yeah. retired person. I just try but to keep up with reading the literature that I keep getting all the time. I haven't given up on all my professional publications and it piles up, I'm afraid. But 
I'm and you're a member of what groups, professional groups? Well, at the present, uh, Geological Society of America, the uh, Society for Mining and Metallurgy. And, and what do each of these do? They tend to be geologic in, in uh, origin. Uh, they do various things having to do with, uh, well, they bring position papers out on various things about what is going on in the world. Um, I'm a member of the Clay Mineral Society. Uh, then I, uh, um, well, I dropped uh, several of them because they were expensive and overseas. But and, and each of these has a website oh, yes. attached to it, and you can become a student member, for yes, instance. Certainly. And many of them um, organize trips, field trips, and this sort of thing. They're open to the, uh, the public. That's right. Ordinary. Well, they, they tend to be professionals, but uh, for instance, the Me New Mexico Geological Society, of which I'm a member too, has field trips around this state. And once a year, they have a field trip someplace or other. Uh, they, in the spring, they have a conference where papers are given by various individuals, including students. And the Bureau of Geology uh, publishes they can. these and other literature as well. They publish the abstracts for sure. But uh, sometimes they'll publish the paper if the individual wants to publish. And the bureau has uh, popular uh, publications also. That Many. And it's got a website too that um, people can look at as well. Right. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. That was good. That was